So, the, uh, we're talking about meditation first of all, before we talk about anything else. Uh, did anyone, did anyone have any uh, uh, happiness in meditation? Did anyone enjoy the meditation? Uh, was the meditation terrible, or was it kind of mid, fair to middling, or was it what was it? Or was it <laughs> any uh, any comments on the meditation before we go on to the talk? Mm. No, nothing. Uh, yeah, uncertain. That looks like the doubtful look over there. <laughs> You're all okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. So you are more than welcome to ask questions about this thing because sometimes it's nice to be able to talk about issues, yeah, yeah. whatever it is. And so, uh, but of course, uh, sometimes it's hard even to formulate questions sometimes. My mind is just, I don't know, I just don't know what to say. <laughs> That's perfectly okay. Yeah. Anyway, so the idea, one of the most important things in that meditation is to talk about it for one minute maybe before we go on, uh, is that it's supposed to be pleasant. Yeah, it's supposed to be something nice. Uh, something that enhances your life rather than detracts from your quality of life. And for this reason it's important that we do it in a kind of in a, in a way which actually does enhance life quality. And very often it's kind of interesting because you know one of the very first teachings, and I really like to tell this to people who do meditation practice, one of the very first teachings of the Buddha was the teaching of the middle way. Has anyone not heard about the teaching of the middle way? Anyone? Anyone? You're very new, okay, so you haven't heard about the middle way, okay, so that's good. Usually, in any crowd, the first teaching here usually is the middle way, yeah? because this was actually the first teaching of the Buddha. And according to the Buddha, what he sets out saying is that uh, if you're going to have success in your spiritual practice, uh, you have to find the middle way between sensual indulgence on the one hand uh, and torturing the body on the other hand. Uh, and what do the vast majority of Buddhists do? Uh, they go to the meditation center and they start torturing the body. It's the first thing they do, even though the first teaching of the Buddha was, please don't talk, torture the body. Yeah. This is how we forget things. Yeah? Even some things that are very obvious and very simple, yeah? we often forget these things because we haven't really understood how to apply them. You hear the middle way and it sounds good, but how do you actually apply it? And you forget that you actually are supposed to apply it to your meditation practice. Yeah? And while we're sitting here, yeah, very often you can't really indulge very much in sensuality while you're sitting there. So the problem usually is one of having too much pain and having too much torture in the body. That's really the biggest problem for many people in meditation practice. But the point about meditation and the reason why it is so powerful is that over time, it goes deeper and deeper and deeper. Over time, it has the potential to really transform your life radically uh, from the way you normally used to live. And for, to enable yourself to actually realize that potential, uh, the only way you'll be able to do that is to enjoy it. Yeah? If you don't enjoy it, uh, you're not going to last very long as a Buddhist, you're not going to last very long as a meditator. Uh, before you know it, you will be out of here. So I'm very glad nobody left the room in the middle of the meditation. That happens sometimes. Yeah? Bang, they're gone. Okay, you know that they're really struggling during the meditation. That happened yesterday, actually. What is that? Uh, oh, yeah. Just after meditation, was one of the one person left. I was a bit bad. Oh, you know, <laughs> that happened. Uh, I'm a failure as a teacher. No, I don't usually <laughs> think that. Uh. Anyway, so the, uh, uh, the topic for tonight's talk is uh, finding true freedom or something like that. Uh. And... Uh, uh, one of the, uh, of course, fundamental things about the Buddhist outlook uh, is that it's quite different from the normal outlook that the vast majority of people have in the world. Uh, the way, place that most people try to find freedom is not the place where Buddhists try to find freedom. Yeah? It's actually almost diametrically opposed uh, where uh, most people try to find it and where, if you are really on the Buddhist path uh, where you try to find it. Uh, and the vast majority try to find it in worldly things. Yeah, you want to enjoy worldly things. You want to make sure that you can do whatever you want in life. And you want to pursue all these things that, you know, entertainments and relationships and all of these kind of things. Yeah. And um, yeah, so that is one the way very often freedom is defined in the world. Yeah. On top of that, you have things like ideas like political freedoms or freedom of thought and these kind of things as well. Yeah. Yeah, but usually it's about external things, external phenomena, how we relate, relate to the world. That is where freedom is usually, uh, you know, the idea of freedom for most people actually lies. Uh, but in Buddhism, it's actually very different from that. According to Buddhism, real freedom can never be found by just pursuing external things. Yeah, having been able to enjoy this, being able to enjoy that. Uh, after a while, it is all quite empty. Yeah? After a while, it doesn't really give any real satisfaction. Yeah? After a while, you realize you're just running after something continuously, again and again and again, never actually finding any real satisfaction. Yeah? 
You look inside of yourself and you know that what you really want is some real satisfaction. You want some real contentment. And there's something inside of you tells you that if you keep on going after things, you will get it. It never happens. And then eventually the penny drops. Maybe I'm looking in the wrong place. And it's so obvious, I think, when you think about it properly, when you, uh, you, you, uh, you know, it's not very hard to see that actually, if you want real contentment, real happiness, instead of pursuing it outside of yourself, you have to look inside. It is a mental problem. It is not an external problem. It's a psychological thing that has to do with our internal state of mind. That is where the problem is. Yeah, and if you, it doesn't tell you, you don't have to, don't have to kind of have that much introspection to realize that actually is the case. So, and one of the things that has always uh, kind of struck me is why is it that so many people actually search for happiness in the wrong place, in external things, a, a world they cannot control, phenomena they can never really make, make their own in a, in a real deep sense. Why is it that even though it is fairly obvious that these things are unreliable, impermanent, not subject to be, to be controlled, uh, why is it that so many people still search for happiness in that realm? And I think one of the problems is that people are not aware of the potential for the development of the mind and changing your mental attitude. Yeah, and the reason why we're not aware of that, and this is, I think, a very deep and profound problem which everyone meets at some stage on the path, and actually often we meet it straight away, and that is the sense of self that we have inside of us. The sense of self tells you, I am like this, these are my qualities, yeah, this is how I define myself. And because you define yourself according to certain qualities and certain personal characteristics and whatever else it is, it is very hard to imagine that you can change. Yeah, if this is who you are, if this is your identity, identity is solid, identity is fixed, identity is permanent. Yeah? By definition, it must be, per must be permanent, otherwise it's not identity, otherwise you're just this floating object without any kind of mooring. Maybe that's what we are. Wait a minute. And then, so the point is, yeah, this is a kind of the whole point of this non-self doctrine in Buddhism, is the idea that this sense of self that we have, that actually blocks us from seeing the potential for personal development, is actually an illusion. And once the sense of self is taken out of the equation, once the idea that there is a permanent aspect inside of us, that is an illusion, then of course it opens up the possibility for mental development in a radical way here, because there's no obstacle anymore here. The sense of self is an obstacle because it tells you there are limits, this is me, this is who I am, you can't go beyond that. Take the sense of self out of the equation and suddenly the potential for development mentally, psychologically, is almost unlimited. So I think that may be part of the problem, yeah? The delusion that we actually cannot change all that much. So we search for happiness in the wrong place. We search for it in a place where never, we will actually never really find true contentment, true happiness and lasting satisfaction. Yeah? So this is kind of the distinction, yeah? If you want to find true freedom in life, true liberation, you have to look in a different place. You have to look inwards uh, rather than looking outwards. Uh. There's a nice little story. I, you know, I, I'm a disciple of Ajahn Brahm, so I have to tell a few stories. Otherwise, I get sacked <laughs> from the monastery. Yeah? There's no more. <laughs> so a few stories are obligatory. This, so this particular story is from the Vinaya Pitaka. The Vinaya Pitaka is the... Uh, um, uh, that camera distracted me for a second there. <laughs> so... The Vinaya Pitaka is the uh, uh, code of conduct for the monastics uh, and also the rules that regulate how the monastic sangha, the monastic community, how it operates, how it functions. Uh, it's actually a very interesting document in so many ways uh, and it shows you the uh, original way that the sangha operated in terms of very democratic, uh, very uh, decentralized, uh, the way the sangha works. Uh, it's actually very interesting in its own right. Uh, I'm not going to get sidetracked too much by that because then we're going to have to need an additional hour for this talk. Yeah. Uh, but one of the stories in there is a, very, it's a nice little, sweet little story. Huh? And uh, this is one, one day there is this monk is sitting at the root of a tree in the forest grove. Huh? Yeah? And he's sitting at this root of a tree and he was born in this very high, he was born the son of a king or something. He was born at the very top of, of the uh, kind of social hierarchy in ancient India. Huh? And he was sitting at this root of a tree, and he was sitting there, and he was saying, Aho Sukang, Aho Sukang. You know what that means? What do you think? Aho Sukang, Aho Sukang. It means, oh, what happiness. 
Oh, what happened? Is, yeah? He's sitting at the, at the root of a tree. He's a monk. He's shaven. He said he's gone forth from the from being a you know the prince in a kind of large kingdom or whatever. Now he's a monk. He's sitting at, at the root of a tree, saying, "Oh, what happened? Is, uh, oh, what happened? Is, uh, and then some of his friends, they come walking by him. Yeah, they kind of they see him sitting there at the root of a tree, saying, "I also come, I also come." Yeah. Get a bit concerned. What is it with our friend Badia? Is the name of this monk? What is it with our friend Badia? He sounds like he's going a bit nuts over there, saying, "I also come, I also come." Yeah. Could there be something wrong with him? Yeah. So they hurry up, they go off, they go off to see the Buddha. And they say to the Buddha, well, this friend of ours, Bandhya, he's sitting at the root of a tree saying, Aho Sukhang, Aho Sukhang. We've been concerned about him. We think that he's now thinking back to the time when he was a prince. He had all the pleasures of the royal palace, yeah, all the fun in the royal palace. And he's thinking back to that. He is dissatisfied in the monastic life. And of course, the Buddha always knows better. So the Buddha says to a certain man, he says, well, go, uh, go, my good man, go to Badia, and actually Badia, and ask him to come into my presence. So the man goes, he gets Badia, and Badia comes into the Buddha's presence. And of always, the Buddha always asks, is it true, this, that what they're saying, that you're sitting at the root of a tree saying, Aho Sukhang, Aho Sukhanga? Yes, Master, it's true, says Badia. Well, why are you doing so? And then he says, well, then, when I think back, at life as a prince and how complicated it was, how difficult it was, and how many duties I had, all the things I had to do. And now I'm sitting at the root of a tree here, enjoying deep meditation, enjoying the free, true freedom of the mind. Yeah? That's what we're trying to get through today. Yeah? Enjoying the true freedom of the mind. That's why I'm sitting here saying, Aho Sukhang, Aho Sukhang. It's a beautiful little story. Here is someone who has everything in life, absolutely everything. Yeah? He is, has all the power of royalty here. He has all the wealth of royalty here, all the enjoyment. And he's obviously a pretty nice guy as well, yeah, because he's kind of had success in the path of meditation. Everything. He's probably loved by the people around him. And yet, he gives everything up because he understands that real happiness, real freedom, real meaning is not found there. It is found somewhere else. Ahosukhanghe. Ahosukhanghe. That's a little story just to get you, get you started, get you an idea that uh, worldly phenomena are never going to give you the thing that you require in this life, that you really want deep down. Uh, and uh, uh, to start off with uh, how, to, how to find this uh, uh, true freedom, this true liberation. One of the things that I've just been talking about before is this idea that people think that having license to enjoy yourself in the world true freedom in terms of pleasures, in terms of enjoying relationships and, and uh, uh, the pleasures of life, all the entertainment you have in London, all the nice restaurants, yeah? This is why London is such a great place, because you have so much entertainment, yeah? So much nice restaurants and all these kind of things. But people come to London, they travel from around the world just to enjoy themselves in this wonderful, marvelous city here. I've just been to the Peak District, that's even more marvelous, yeah, than London. Beautiful, peaceful, very nice, very, very wonderful London. But uh, this is what people, uh, people think, yeah. and very often, uh, uh, of course, the Buddhist way is that you set certain constraints on how you can enjoy yourself. Uh, there's already certain constraints as a lay person, uh, those constraints become even more powerful if you are a monastic, obviously. Uh, you're constraining yourself. If you just take on certain morality, uh, it means that there are certain pleasures you can't have, because the morality constrains you from doing those things. Uh. And this is one of the reasons why uh, many people in the world that don't want to live a moral life, yeah, because living a moral life is uh, constraining you. So you can't have all the happiness and all the enjoyment that you want. Uh. So people throw out morality and say, let's enjoy, enjoy us instead. Uh. But of course, that is under misunderstanding in a very fundamental way where true freedom lies. Uh. Because if you practice morality, uh, it's, of course it's going to constrain you on the outside, uh, but it starts doing something to your mind. Uh. What does it start to do? It starts to reduce some of the defilements of the mind. Uh. It starts to reduce some of the oppressive states. Anger is oppressive. Yeah, anger is very oppressive in life. If you can have a sense of metta and kindness for all people around you, uh, even Donald Trump, yeah? People, some people were talking about Donald Trump on this retreat. I thought, let's get out of politics, but still, it kind of had to come up. So even if, if you don't like Donald Trump, even if you don't like him, yeah? Still have a sense of compassion and metaphor for him. Yeah? If you can do that, you're getting rid of a massive oppression inside of yourself. Restlessness, another oppression, yeah? An oppression which kind of drives you around. You can't sit still, you can't enjoy the peace of just watching the breath. Having tiredness and lethargy, another oppression inside of you, yeah? 
And you start to realize when you practice morality, uh, what happens that uh, these defilements of the mind, they start to drop down, uh, they become less, and you feel an inner freedom. Uh, and that inner freedom is far, far, far more valuable than the outer freedom of enjoying yourself in the world outside. Uh, that inner freedom is real freedom. Uh, the outer freedom is like a fake freedom. Fake news, fake freedom. Yeah, uh, This is how it goes. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, uh, and uh, it is fake because you can see people who enjoy themselves with those kind of freedoms, still they are miserable, still they are depressed, still they sometimes even commit suicide. Why? Because that act of freedom really, at the end of the day, is not that relevant. Uh. And there's a very nice story that Ajahn Brahm tells, uh, and this is a story uh, about two very famous monks in the northeast of Thailand. Eh? The northeast of Thailand is where all the famous monks were, eh? because that was the most boring place in Thailand. There was nothing going on. It was the exact opposite. It was the antithesis of London. Yeah, There was no entertainment, no restaurant, no nothing. There was just uh, rice paddies and water buffaloes. That's all you had. Eh? And that is great for meditation practice. There's nothing interesting outside, but you find the interest inside instead. Eh? So if you want to go meditation, go to the northeast of Thailand. Eh? It's one possibility anyway. Yeah? So the story is these two, they have, so because of that, that is the place in Thailand that is most famous for all the uh, Aryans, the noble ones, the Arahans and the Sotapanas and all the people who have a lot of success in meditation practice. Yeah? The north is of Thailand. Go to the boring places, that's where you find the Arahans in the world, mm -hmm. the enlightened beings. Uh, so chances that I am enlightened is very, very small because I'm in such an exciting place, at least right now. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, you go there, and what was interesting, there was one of the Ajahn friends, he also went to this particular, they went to a dana, went to somebody's house, uh, and when they went to this dana in somebody's house, it was a kind of fairly wealthy family, maybe they were visiting Bangkok or something, I can't really remember, and in this house they have an aquarium, yeah, and in this aquarium of course all these fish swimming around her. So these two very senior and very famous Thai monks, they were talking among each other here. And the one of them said, the other one said, oh, it's terrible. They're capturing all these fish, putting them in the water tanks. They have no freedom in this water tank. Yeah, we should go and release those fish. Actually, I don't think he said that, because that would have been really bad. You can't just go and release people's fish. Yeah, that is, not, that is kind of immoral. So please don't do that. When you go to somebody's house, don't just go to the aquarium and start releasing the fish, because it uh, may be very unpopular if you do that. Uh, but what was, what was very interesting was that uh, uh, the other monk said, no, you're not right about this. Uh, this, is not this is not how it works. Uh, the way it works that is a fish that is in the aquarium uh, is free of so many dangers. Uh, yeah, there's only one type or only friendly fish in the aquarium. There's no sharks, there's no uh, piranhas and this kind of fish. There's no kind of fish-eating fish. Yeah, they're all friendly fish in there. The, water, the uh, food supply is always constant. Every day they get fed at the right time, just to have the right body size, not too fat, not too thin. Because fish also get fat, you know, if they get too fat too much. So just kind of the right shape, to be in good shape and all these kind of things. The temperature of the water, always perfect, always just pleasant, yeah, etc., etc., etc. So he was saying, making the point that even though these fish have certain boundaries, they get so much in return. And those boundaries are actually far less important than getting all these other things in return. Actually, we don't know that because we can't ask the fish, but that's kind of the <laughs> assumption here, yeah? So those, actually, you get so much in return for having those boundaries, those four glass walls around you, that quite likely it is much better. Then we get the fish doctor come in if you have a disease, all this kind of stuff. Do they have fish doctors? Probably do, yeah? But they have all kinds of doctors, fish doctors as well. I've never met, never met one. You meet many people in life, I've never met a fish, fish doctor before. Yeah? <laughs> So, uh, and that is exactly the same thing as with morality. Yeah, yeah it puts certain constraints on your life, certain boundaries. Uh, but actually, in the long run, it is far, far preferable life to live. Uh, if you can live with certain constraints, uh, if you can live with kindness, uh, you want to live a life which is really kind of uh, unpleasant without these uh, very important qualities of mind. Uh, and I'm sure you know straight away what I mean, uh, yeah? Because it is so obvious. Uh, and the oppression in the mind declines. Uh, the oppression goes down, the, the suffering, the problems, the defilements, all of these things come down. And that is where true liberation comes in. It's really liberation from oppression. Yeah, we talk about ending suffering on the Buddhist path. And of course, suffering is primary, is the prime oppression in human life and any other life for that matter. Yeah. So let us have a look at some of these defilements of the mind and 
and trying to understand why it is that they are oppressive, why they are problematic. And one way of looking at this, I was just giving a talk yesterday about the five hindrances. I might as well talk a little bit about those now as well. Yeah, it makes it easy to talk about exactly the same thing in yeah, two talks. So, so, so you, and of the five hindrances, five hindrances for those of you who are new to the Buddhist teachings, yeah, these are obstacles on the meditation path. Things that stop you from going deeper in meditation, becoming peaceful, having insight, having clarity, and all these kinds of things. Yeah. And the first one of these, oh, okay, first one, it doesn't sound too good, but metallic. Yeah. So the first one of these uh, hindrances uh, is uh, called sensual desire. Yeah, the desire we have for all the objects of the world uh, and also all the attachments that we have for the things in our life, the things we own, uh, our relationships, all of these kind of things. Uh, that's part of sensual desire. Uh, a very important part of it is the objects of the material world that we attach to, that we hold on to. Uh, behave yourself, uh, <laughs> Sorry? Yeah. Okay, maybe I'll put a bit further down. Can you still? Is that too? Oh, it's not working. Is that alright? Yeah? Okay, good. Let's try that and see what happens. There. And, uh, so, uh, and what is the problem with sensual desire? And one of the things that the Buddha says in the suttas is that if you indulge in the sensual things, uh, it is as if you are, if you still have sensual desire and attachment to sensual object, it is as if you have a debt. Yeah, you have a debt. Why is it that we have a debt when we indulge too much in the sensual world and we attach too much to sensual phenomena or sensual objects, if you like? What is going on there? And this is one of those very important and very basic things to understand on the Buddhist path. Whenever we attach to things, whenever we hold on to things, nature is always going to come at some stage and take it away from us. Yeah, you know that this is true. Everyone knows that this is true because uh, uh, the world uh, of the world outside, uh, you can sometimes you can hold on to your relationships for a lifetime, sometimes much shorter than that, uh, at the very most a lifetime. Uh, and when you die, when you pass away, you're going to have to give it all up. Uh, yeah, and if you attach too much, uh, and nature says now is time to take it back again, uh, nature says that now your relationship has lasted for twenty years, and now you're going to have a divorce. Yeah. When that happens, you're going to suffer because you were attached to those things in the first place. So this is one of the ways of understanding the idea of all the sensual... It's kind of dramatic. This is the idea with Buddhism. Buddhism is the idea is to be, uh, is to be uh, honest, yeah? but honest in a very profound sense, uh, or brutally honest, if you like, yeah? seeing things really as they actually are. Uh, and this is the problem with all these worldly phenomena. All the things that we attach to in the world, they are subject to change, subject to not being controlled. And because of that, there will come a time when you're going to have to pay back the debt of attaching to these things. And it's kind of obvious, isn't it, in many ways? You can kind of understand this. One day we're all going to have to pass away. It is obvious. And the more you understand that, the more you understand that the liberation, the freedom of the mind, comes from developing a mind center where these attachments gradually go down. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that we have to give up our relationships. It doesn't even mean that we have to give up our possessions. The main thing it means is that we have to develop our mind in such a way that we have an inner strength, an inner happiness that is able to counteract these problems when they arise. And this is a difference between someone who has lived life really well. If you have lived your life really well, it doesn't matter if you are a monastic or a lay person. It doesn't really matter exactly. Your status in life is not the important one. But if you have lived your life well, it means that at the end of life you have built up a store of independence, of happiness, of enjoyment in yourself, of contentment, yeah? which means that your attachment to external things are not so great. And then you can pass on into your whatever future existence you may have after that. You can pass on to that with a sense of uh, equanimity, a sense of contentment, not being too touched by the things that you are leaving behind. Yeah, this is what life is all about. This is one of the very important things of, of life. You are actually achieving a higher degree of freedom when you pass away than when you came into this world. And this is a wonderful thing, actually. Maybe you think that this might end up in you becoming a monastic, but you really want to be in that relationship, so you, want, you don't want to think about that. But don't, please don't think like that, because one of the things that you will find out is that as these attachments become a little bit less, usually our relationships become better. 
Yeah, this is kind of the, the, the kind of strange thing that people often say, you have to have attachments to each other. But the answer actually is no, it is often the exact opposite. Because when you reduce your attachments to people around you, you have less vested interest in those, those relationships. Yeah, if you have children, for example, yeah, we often take our children to be like an extension of ourselves. And if our children misbehave in good company, yeah, we feel a bit embarrassed. Yeah, behave yourself. Yeah, you. This is this is kind of my. I want to. You know, I, I have tried trying to bring you up for goodness' sake. If you kind of behave badly now, it's going to look really bad on me. Yeah, this is what happens to some extent because we have a vested interest in the relationships around us. The more detached we are, in a sense, the more cool we are about these things, the more uh, we are not so vested, invested in that particular relationship, the more we are able to react in those relationships in a way that is in the best interest of the other person, rather than being in our own best interest. Yeah, you see the difference there? It's actually very beautiful. As the detachment decreases, you have less suffering and less pain. And you're also able to deal with the people around you in your ordinary life in a more neutral, in a more skillful and in a wiser fashion. It's actually very nice when that happens. The people in the world who suffer the most are often the ones who are most attached. The people in the world who shout at the children, I always feel so terrible when I see people shouting at the children. But sometimes it happens because it's unavoidable sometimes. Yeah? But it happens usually because of attachments in the wrong way. Yeah? So this is the first thing. And this is about the idea of the debt that we often incur as a, a cause of a, how we relate to the world around us. So, to relate to the world in a different way. Yeah? This doesn't mean that you have to do anything dramatically different in your life. Yeah? All it means is that you focus more on the process of how you live. Yeah? What is that process? What do I mean by that? I mean, how do you deal with people on a daily basis? What is the process that you go through when you're trying to achieve certain goals in your, uh, in your uh, professional life, in your family life? How do you try to achieve those goals? That is the process. And if that process is filled with kindness, with understanding, with compassion, with generosity to the people around you, that is when your life becomes better. The process is what is important, not so much the goals. That is almost all you need to know, yeah? You focus on the process, don't focus on the goals. And you're in business, pretty much. That's all you have to do. That's really a very nice way of actually summarizing the spiritual life. But I'm going to talk a bit more anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so that is the first of these kind of hindrances that we talk about. Another one, and this is probably a far more important one for most people, and that is the hindrance of ill will. And I would really recommend you to put a bit of effort into overcoming the negativity and ill will of the mind. And one of the things that the Buddha says about ill will, the uh, simile that he uses for that, is that you are like you are sick, you are ill when you have ill will. You're kind of, you know, we better put you to bed and give you some, uh, you know, whatever, some cold compressions, whatever you get when you get really sick. Yeah? Put you to bed, yeah? Why is that? Uh? And the reason is, if you get really sick, yeah, you have a high fever, yeah, it's like you are deluded. Yeah, you see all kind of weird things, feverish kind of dreams, all this kind of stuff. You get deluded when you are really sick. Yeah. And when you are angry, you are also deluded. Yeah. You are in a state where it absolutely incapable of seeing things in a straight way. Yeah. It is when you are angry that you do things that you later regret. Yeah, would you... Yeah, right, you know what I mean? You say something a bit too fast. You do an act that you later on think, I should have done that. Even you might even think thoughts that you know you shouldn't be really be thinking. And when you come out of your anger, that only then do you realize that was a mistake. So why is it that you did that thing when you were angry, but you actually understand afterwards that it was a mistake? And the reason is because when you were angry, you were deluded. You didn't know what you were doing. You were a bit crazy, basically. Yeah, you're a bit insane. The Buddha says that when you're angry, essentially you are a little bit insane. So we're all a little bit insane. Yeah, so there's no need to kind of have too many, to kind of look down upon people who are, have mental problems. We all have a little bit of mental problems, except maybe the Arahant. And it's a nice way of actually remembering the problem with anger and ill will. You are now, you are sick. Yeah, you need to take the day off and just relax because this isn't going. That's pretty good, isn't it? Take the day off every time I get angry. <laughs> Whoa, we have many days off, yeah? <laughs> Boss, I'm really sick to the Buddha, who is my real doctor. He says, I'm sick today. I'm going to take the day off. <laughs> now, I'm giving you some terrible ideas here. That's really, really bad. I'm going to be kind of uh, the boss. Your boss is going to come after me and give me a hard time. So that is a very kind of simple way of thinking about anger as illness and how troublesome and difficult it actually is. 
Uh, the third of these hindrances that we're talking about, this is the hindrance of tiredness and lethargy, here, sometimes called sloth and torpor, here, which um, I prefer tiredness and lethargy. Here. And uh, this is often the simile or the, the use for that is a simile of a prison. Here. Yeah, when you are really tired, your mind is kind of contracted inside of yourself, you can't, you can't really formulate thoughts properly. Yeah, you know what it's like when you have tightness in the day? It feels like you're imprisoned inside of yourself. You can't really reach out to the world properly. But when you're bright, you feel that you can reach out to people around you, you can talk to them, you can make yourself understood properly, and you can communicate properly with people as a consequence. So uh, if you want to be free of prison, uh, out of prison, uh, then you, what you do, uh, this is another lack of freedom obviously, uh, what you do is you develop a bright mind, uh, a mind that is beautiful, light uh, and bright uh, and has a kind of uh, buoyancy and lightness to it, like a balloon flowing up. Yeah? One of the nice metaphors I like here is the idea of a balloon. Uh, as you live your life well, you're filling that balloon with helium. Uh, and as you are cutting off some of these hindrances, some of these defilements of the mind, it's like cutting off the tethers that tethers that balloon to the ground, chucking out some of the sandbags that you use for weight. Yeah? And as you chuck out the sandbags, cut the tethers, uh, and you fill the balloon with helium, it soars. Uh, and as it soars, it's like your mind is soaring. Uh, you get a lighter, more beautiful, more... Uh, uh, more um, buoyant mind, yeah, and as you do that you soar over the landscape uh, and you start to see things in a different way because you get the bird's eye view as you go high up uh, and when you get the bird's eye view, uh, that's where you get insights, uh, that's where you start to understand things in accordance with reality here. Yeah. But going high up is like having samadhi, seeing things from above uh, and from that samadhi, from that stillness of the mind, uh, that is where the insight comes, you see the landscape below you. Uh. It's a beautiful simile for the Buddhist path, uh, but the soaring happens. It happens why? Because you let go of these defilements, this uh, anti-liberation, anti-freedoms that hold you down, uh, and then the liberation happens in this way. Uh. The next defilement is the one which is called restlessness and remorse very often, uh, and of course to overcome remorse, the best way of doing that is simply to live well. Uh. Yeah, if you live generally with kindness in your life, you're going to have less remorse uh, and less regrets. Uh. Uh, and uh, the restlessness part of it is often uh, compared by the Buddha to a, a slave driver. Uh, yeah, Restlessness is your slave driver. Uh, so it means that if you are restless, uh, you are a slave. You feel like a slave uh, sometimes. Uh, yeah? Yeah. Restlessness comes into your mind, agitation driving you on, yeah? making you do things. Uh, you'd rather actually just like to sit down and be still, but then when you close your eyes and you want to be still, your mind just moves all over the place. Yeah? The body doesn't really settle down, uh, and you actually want to get up all the time and do something else instead. That's restlessness. Uh, you are a slave to the restlessness. Uh, and this is a very interesting defilement because actually it is very, very closely connected to the, I think it's my hand, I'm waving my hands too much, <laughs> is the, the defilement very closely related to the idea of desire, yeah, restlessness. Uh, because when you have lots of desires in your mind, the desires are always about a state that is not fulfilled. Uh, you feel unfulfilled. Uh, you want to move somewhere else, and that feeling of having to go somewhere else, obviously, is very closely related to restlessness. Uh, yeah, so desires and restlessness are very closely um, conjoined to each other. Yeah. And one of the beautiful suttas, one of the beautiful quotes, I was just reading this out on the retreat that we had up in the Peak District uh, this last week. Yeah. And this is this quote, this is a sutta called the Ratapala Sutta. Yeah. And in this sutta, uh, this monk called Ratapala, he speaks to a king. Yeah. Uh, and this king asks this monk Ratapala, he says to him, should we change? No, is it? Is it okay? Yeah. Fine, okay. And this king says to this monk Ratapala, you are young, you came from a good family, you were wealthy, you had everything in life, yeah? You were not sick, you had everything in life, and still you went forth. Why is that? Why is it that someone, usually when you are sick, yeah, you are miserable, you lost all your possessions on the stock market, that's when you go forth, yeah? There's no purpose in living anymore, yeah? yeah I didn't say the stock market, because that's kind of, I didn't have a stock market in those days, but you know, and so what is the reason? Yeah. And then Ratapala gives these four reasons for why he went forth. Uh, and one of these very interesting reasons, he says that uh, uh, these are four teachings that he got from the Buddha. And one of them is, life is insatiated, incomplete, uh, the slave of craving. Uh, yeah, Craving is a thing that always comes after us. Uh, craving is very closely related to the idea of restlessness. Uh, because when you crave, you are restless. Uh, craving drives you on. Uh, 
It is a very different way of regarding the world from the way we normally regard the world. Because usually we regard craving as something positive. You crave and then you choose to go after the cravings. Yeah, You choose to satisfy them. Enjoy the craving for goodness sake, because that's what life is all about. Crave, desire, then run after them and satisfy them, and then you'll be happy. Yeah? But the Buddha says, no, it's exactly the exact opposite. Craving is the slave driver. Yeah? Craving is the restlessness that always makes you run around from one thing to the next one. Yeah? And as soon as you think that you have satisfied one craving, another craving arises just behind it. Yeah? There is no satisfaction in the realm of craving. You are always driven on. Yeah? And the reason why we often feel so enticed by craving. Yeah? One of the main reasons is because we identify with the doer, yeah? with the agent inside. Yeah? You know what I mean? You identify with the doer. Yeah? When you do, you feel alive. Yeah? I'm doing things. Yeah? Some people have identified with the doer in a very profound sense. Or they spend their whole life running around yeah? and you start feeling alive because you do things. Yeah? I'm sure you have all know what I'm talking about. You have some idea what this is, this is about. And because we identify with the doer, then when craving arises, you f yet that identity gets satisfied. I am now expressing my identity as the doer through running after all these wonderful things that I crave for. I get them all, then I will be happy and satisfied. No, you won't be happy and satisfied. And that is precisely the problem. And what is so interesting about this is that this ident identification with the doer uh, is actually a very uh, useless and very uh, uh, counterproductive kind of identification. Because what happens, and this is what happens in meditation practice, uh, and why meditation is so beautiful and why it is so powerful, uh, one of the many reasons, uh, as you start to calm down, uh, as the uh, craving, as the doing calms down, uh, you actually start to realize that the less doing there is, uh, the more happy, the more content you are, the less things are happening in life, uh, the better you feel about yourself. Yeah. And you start to understand that this whole idea of identifying with a doer is a con job. Yeah, this is, this is you know, what, what, what I'm, I'm identifying with suffering. That's what you're identifying with. Uh, if doing, if agency, if movement of the mind, if running after craving, if all of this is suffering, and this you can actually see that in your meditation practice, because the more peaceful you are, the more better you feel about yourself. If that is suffering, it means that you are identifying with suffering when you identify with the doer, with the agency inside of you. Isn't that kind of a radical? You are, you're new to Buddhism, yeah? Have you heard about this before? Yeah? You see, there you are. Buddhism is, this is why Buddhism is so interesting, because it has some insights that are actually very hard to come by in other, uh, you know, almost any other kind of philosophy, if you like. Yeah. But this, you start to understand that. Uh, and that when you start to understand that, you start to understand that freedom is not found in pursuing things through your will, through your volition, through your choice. Uh, Freedom is actually found in the diametrically opposite direction by letting go of all the doing, letting go of all the choosing, and actually becoming still inside. There's like a double whammy there. Those things that you pursue through choice, but through agency, through using the doer, those things are not really worthwhile pursuing in the first place. And on top of that, the very act of pursuit is suffering. Pretty bad news, yeah? It's, it pretty, doesn't get much worse than that. Uh, so, <laughs> because of that, you start to withdraw from the agency here. Yeah? You start to withdraw from the, from the doing. You start to understand that doing is a problem. And when you start to get that, it becomes so much more easy to be peaceful in your meditation practice. Why? Because you no longer express the doing. Because there's no point in, in expressing what is actually suffering here. Yeah? So that is the fourth of these five hindrances. The fifth one is the hindrance of doubt. And doubt is often uh, expressed in the suttas with a simile of going through a desert, uh, going through a place where there's no drinking, nothing to eat, it's just barren, there's nothing to see, or there's all these cactuses around. Actually, that's kind of, cactus are quite nice, yeah? What is the plural of cactuses? Cacti? Cactus? Cacti? Cacti? Is it? Okay, whatever. <laughs> so. Uh, so yeah, in this very barren place, there's kind of there's nothing there to sustain you. All you see is kind of you know desert everywhere, or rocks, kind of you know stupid rocks or whatever. Not not nice rocks, stupid rocks. So. <laughs> <laughs> so you're walking through this landscape, nothing to eat, nothing to drink. Yeah, it's kind of terrible. Huh? And this is what it's like to have doubt. Why is that? And uh, the reason is because. Uh, in life, if all you have are the ordinary things of life that everyone has, 
the pleasures, ordinary pleasures of life, the ordinary things that we attach to, yeah, the things that everyone does, get an education, get married, have kids, have a job, become a pensioner, die, yeah. <laughs> okay, wait a minute, and then you die, and you look back, you think, what was that all about? Yeah, I've been doing all of these things, I've been doing what everyone else does, yeah, and now what? I'm dying here. And you think back and you wonder what it was all about. And I think a lot of people, when they come to the deathbed, they start to wonder, what was this all about? I've been doing all of this thing. Has it got me anywhere? Have I actually achieved anything kind of final or any sense of completion, anything like that? Not really. I've just been doing all these things, following along like a sheep in society because everybody else does it. And now I'm here and I wonder what it was all about. And this is the problem with life. If you haven't got something more to life than the mere pursuing of what everyone else pursues, and if you look at people in general, they're not you know, super duper happy or anything like that. They kind of go through their lives, okay, they may be okay, but they haven't really found the meaning of life or anything like that. So you, sometimes you think, maybe I should go a different path. Maybe I should do something else. Because when you follow, when you walk through life, just doing the ordinary things in life, it feels dry, it feels barren. There's nothing there to really give you that additional kind of wetness that makes life exciting or interesting or joyful, yeah? You do this ordinary pleasures of the world, which don't really lead to any real satisfaction or happiness. It's like walking through a desert, a desert free of spiritual teaching, free of a higher purpose, free of something which actually is really beautiful in a very profound and deep sense. You haven't got that, and that is so problematic. Yeah. So then one day you come to the Buddhist teachings instead, or maybe some other spiritual teaching as well. Many spiritual teachings can be uplifting. Yeah. Personally, I think the Buddhist teaching is the superior one, otherwise I wouldn't be a Buddhist monk. Yeah, It kind of goes without saying. It's not because I kind of look down upon others, just that I chose this because I thought it was best. That's, that's the reason. Yeah. Otherwise, there has to be a reason for this. Yeah. But you find a spiritual teaching here. Yeah. And you find that it nourishes you in a far more profound sense. If you practice the spiritual teaching in the right way, it gives rise to joy on the Buddhist path. It gives rise to contentment. It gives rise to all of these things that you have been looking for all along. That craving told you it was going to supply to you, but that craving never delivers. Craving says, when you get this, I will be happy. Yeah, when I get that relationship, oh, I will be so happy because this... Uh, this woman, this man, oh, they are so wonderful, yeah. And of course, it lasts for a while, it's wonderful for a while, and then it isn't wonderful anymore. Or it really is wonderful for a long time, and then you die, and then it isn't wonderful anymore, yeah. So it kind of is problematic, regardless of how it works out. So here, you go something, you find something more profound, something really deep, something really satisfies you in a very, very profound way. Yeah? And this is why it is so beautiful, and that is why the path Buddhist path is not like walking through the desert, like walking through a lush forest with lots of beautiful mango trees, yeah? You just pluck off the mangoes. Wow, this mango is so sweet. Except that mangoes are sensual pleasures, of course, but, you know, you get the idea. It's a metaphor. It's not meant to be taken literally. Yeah? So that is what, how this path, uh, how, why these things are also oppressive, uh, why they are anti-freedoms of the mind, and why they block you from actually getting access to real liberation, real freedom in life. And to, just to look at the Buddhist path in a little bit more detail, there's one very nice part of the Buddhist path that I really uh, enjoyed a lot when I read it, and this part of the path is called Dependent Liberation, yeah? and it shows you essentially the <coughs> process of meditation as you are freed from the world. What is that process of meditation? And it's a very powerful kind of teaching, and it's found in many places in the Buddhist suttas. It is a core aspect of the Buddhist teachings. This is one of those teachings you can feel very sure that the Buddha would have taught, because it is everywhere in the suttas. He taught it to everybody. And this sequence of dependent liberation it starts off with sila, sila being morality. Yeah, you are moral. In a very deep sense, you are moral. You are moral not just in the sense of not doing bad stuff, but you are moral in the sense of deliberately doing good things, yeah? And you're also moral in the sense of thinking kind thoughts uh, and thoughts of compassion to the people around you. Very deep sense of morality, yeah? From that deep sense of morality comes non-remorse, uh, yeah? Because you start to feel good about yourself. Uh, 
not in a, I always have to say this, not in an egotistical way, huh? not in a sense, I am better than others, look at those scallywags over there, they are not moral, not like mm -hmm. that at all, huh? not comparing yourself to others, huh? but simply acquired satisfaction, knowing that you're living your life well. Huh? Yeah, you kind of close your eyes, uh, you're meditating, and you have this positive feeling inside of you because you know that you're living your life in the right way. That is non-remorse, that is non-regret. Uh. And from that non-regret comes the Pali, comes the Pamuja, Pamuja means gladness or joy. Uh. From the gladness or joy, this is now, we're into the meditation process, yeah? this is what happens. You practice morality in ordinary life, then when you sit down and meditate, this is what happens. Uh. The Pamuja comes, the gladness or the joy in the mind comes. Uh. From the gladness and the joy comes the pity. Yeah? Pity is more happiness, rapture, often translated as rapture. Yeah? From that rapture, often felt as kind of physical uh, rapture coursing through the body, yeah? very, very, kind of, uh, very pleasant at this stage, very, very nice, so, and the mind starts to become peaceful. Yeah? From that, as you go deeper, comes tranquility, yeah? where your mind calms down, you become solid like a rock. Yeah? You never want to move from the seat for the rest of your life. Yeah? You have to, but you don't want to. Yeah? Yeah, eventually you're going to have to go, yeah. but at, at, at that moment it feels like you never want to do anything else. Yeah. From that sense of deep tranquility of body and mind, a, a profound sense of happiness arises. Yeah. Happiness because of the tranquility, yeah. because everything is so beautiful by now. You feel this very, very deep sense of happiness. Yeah. And that is what draws you to the meditation object, because happiness is what glues your mind to the meditation object. Yeah, Happiness always... Uh, attracts you. So because you are attracted to happiness, meditation becomes powerful in a very, uh, becomes possible in a very powerful way. Uh, this is how meditation works. Uh, and this is why it is so important to give rise to a pleasant abiding in the present moment, because that will enable you to stay with a meditation object, because it is so pleasurable. Uh, so you will notice something about this path. Uh, it is all about happiness. More and more profound happiness is as you go along. Uh, why is it more and more happy here? And the reason why it is more happy is that you are letting go of burdens as you go along here. Yeah, letting go of obstacles, letting go of problems. So as you carry on on this path, the very, some of the very first thing that you have let go of is immorality, is bad ways of thinking, bad ways of living, and already you feel good about yourself. Because you feel good about yourself, you let go of a burden. You have already achieved a certain state of liberation here. As you go deeper in your meditation practice, the body starts to fade away. Your senses start to fade away. And as your senses fade away, you feel inside of yourself, you feel that you're letting go of a part of the world which actually is relatively painful compared to the world inside. As you let go of that, the bliss starts to arise. Why? Because you're letting go of non-freedom. You're letting go of a burden. And you may have heard these stories, there are these stories that you may have heard about people having out-of-body experiences. And you heard about out-of-body experiences? You probably have, yeah? If you're interested in this kind of things, you're very likely you have. And it was a very interesting out-of-body experience. This was a, from the United States. There was a lady who had an aneurysm in the brain, like an you know, assembly of blood or whatever, happening, blood happening inside the brain. And they had to uh, operate on her because if it had you know, exploded or whatever, it would have kind of killed her almost instantaneously. Uh, had to get this large blob of uh, blood out of her brain. Uh, it was a very complicated operation because it was basically in the middle of her brain. So how are we going to get this one out? Uh, and they figured the only way to get it out, this was back in the 1980s, maybe now there are easier ways, uh, but it was to cool the body down so the metabolism of the body basically went to zero, uh, then drain the blood out of the brain, yeah? then open up her skull, uh, then kind of fix the problem, uh, and then kind of put it all back together again and restart the whole thing. It, it sounds like an absolutely astonishing kind of operation. Uh, and the chances of success were apparently very low, but uh, living with the aneurysm was even worse. So she kind of went inside to go through it. And as she was going through this, uh, yeah, she had this incredible out-of-body experience. Uh, she was out of her body. And while she was out of her body, she said, it was so beautiful to be out of my body. It was so nice. It's a very common experience. Uh, and this is why meditation is very similar. As your body fades away, it becomes very beautiful. Uh, but she was out of her body, yeah, it's, it's looking at the operating theater, according to the story, and this operation went on for a long time. So it was a long out-of-body experience. And then, as often happens with these things, some voice or something tells you, you've got to go back. 
She didn't want to go back. Yeah, this miserable body was lying there all hacked up on the operation table. <laughs> Don't want to go back to this body. Yeah, look at this miserable body. Yeah. And, but she, sometimes you have no choice. You are drawn back to your body. So she was drawn back to her body. And afterwards, when everything was kind of put back together and she woke up, and she told the story. And she said it was like getting back into a refrigerator. That's what she said. It was the most worst experience of her life. She, her mind was drawn into this refrigerator because the body had been taken down to 17 degrees or something like that. Yeah, really, really cool. And she said, now, going back to the refrigerator was actually a terrible experience. So if you want to get out of the refrigerator here, yeah, you've got to have your meditation work properly here. Yeah. And the antidote to that refrigeration yeah, yeah, of the body here yeah, is the bliss and the happiness that comes uh, as a consequence when you start to let go of the body. This is what liberation is about. Uh, you're freeing yourself from suffering. Yeah, and as a consequence of that, uh, the bliss, the joy, the stillness, uh, they are the alternative. They take the place of the problem that was there before yeah. So your senses fade away, the body fades away, yeah? all the defilements in your mind, all of these desires, all the restlessness, all that also fades away. You become more and more focused, yeah? Until eventually, yeah, as you keep on doing this, more and more things disappear in your mind. Yeah? Less and less is actually uh, there. Yeah? Eventually comes the point when you reach a state where the mind is completely, utterly unified and all there is in your mind is bliss and nothing else. Yeah? That sounds good. Huh? You're not going to leave now, are you? No, I... <laughs> no sorry. I, the, uh, I thought you were going to pick up your, your bottle and leave, you see? So I, I was getting worried because now it gets really exciting, you see? So you want to stay for the excitement, otherwise it gets really terrible. So here you are, for the first time in your life, your mind is completely unified. Huh? There's no more desire, there's no more restlessness. All you are experiencing is only a single experience. And that is bliss upon bliss upon bliss, continuously, yeah, from moment to moment to moment to moment. That is all you are experiencing here. And because all you are experiencing is bliss, yeah, and because you have no more desire, no more craving, anything like that, it means you are absolutely perfectly still, yeah, complete pasadi, complete stillness in the mind, no more movement of anything at all. And what that means is that temporarily you have actually experienced the answer to the very meaning of life itself. You've found absolute freedom. Yeah? It's not a a absolute, absolute. It's very, very close to absolute freedom. Why? Because you have no more desires, nothing more to drive you on, no, nothing more to be done in your life. Yeah? If, there is, if you haven't reached the meaning of life, it means there's more to be done. The moment you have reached the meaning of life, there's nothing to be done. And this is what it feels like when you reach deep samadhi. It feels like there's nothing more to be done. Ergo, QED, you have now found the answer to the very meaning of life itself. This is what this is about, yeah? And it's from freeing yourself from all of these oppressive states by going through the process of meditation and then one day, final freedom from everything, yeah? Through meditation practice. It's not yet entirely final, that, because the problem is that states of samadhi, states of meditation, they come to an end, unfortunately. Yeah? So because of that, there is an additional thing that we have to do. And this is the final element of freedom on the Buddhist path. And that is the element where you also have insight. You have an understanding of what is going on there. And when you have an insight based on that state of samadhi, understanding where happiness is to be found, you undermine craving, you undermine desire 100%. And desire is cut off once and for all. And when desire is cut off once and for all, there's nothing more to seek for, nothing more to be done in life. It means that you have found, ultimately, the answer to the very meaning of life. Nothing more to be done. Nowhere, nowhere more to go. From now on until you pass away, all you have to do is just to experience bliss and happiness and all of these things. There's nothing more to be done, apart from maybe teaching others a little bit, yeah? which is a nice thing to do when you eventually reach awakening. Yeah? So this is the highest freedom you, you can achieve on the Buddhist path. Yeah? And very often this highest freedom we talk about on the Buddhist path is often talked about in terms of elimination and freedom from suffering. Yeah? And it's kind of Okay, free of suffering, yeah, it's, it's okay, yeah, it's, it's a good thing. Yeah. You agree with that? It's good to be free of suffering, yeah, sounds okay. But it doesn't sound that exciting, yeah, it sounds a bit bland, yeah, you're free of suffering, now what? Now it's kind of boring, yeah, suffering is gone, now what? But that's not really the point, yeah. The point is that when you are free of suffering, you feel incredibly happy, yeah. This is kind of the point. Yeah? So one of the important things with the Buddhist teachings is that we have to express these things in the right way, in a way that would actually 
people understand what is really happening. If you always talk about things in terms of freedom of suffering, we actually miss the point that this is a state of the highest happiness that is possible to achieve as a human being. Yeah? Yeah? And this is really the point here. Yeah? So total freedom, total liberation, yes, it means liberation from suffering, but it also means at the same time the achievement of the highest happiness that is possible for a human being. Yeah? So are you, would you like to take part in this or not? <laughs> yeah, it's your choice. <laughs> you don't have to if you don't want to, you can leave, you know. But, uh, <laughs> and for me, this is what was so powerful for me. Yeah? When I started to really study these Buddhist teachings, uh, and I started to understand, at least for me, it was obvious this is the answer to the very question of the meaning of life. Uh, once you get that, uh, once you start to get an inkling that this is true, uh, then that is where commitment uh, and where perseverance on the Buddhist path comes from. Uh, this is why I've been a Buddhist monk now for, what is it, 22 years, something like that. Yeah. So that is kind of, a, kind of a while. I hope it lasts much, much longer than that, uh, because it's pretty cool to be a Buddhist monk, actually. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. so there you are. I'm not going to talk anymore, because I've talked for almost an hour already. It's amazing how, how much you can, how, not much, how quickly time goes by, I suppose. Yeah. But what I would like to do, one of the things I always do on these uh, talks, is to give people an opportunity to ask questions and to make comments and to, uh, if you must complain, even complaints are acceptable. We can even deal with that probably. Yeah? So whatever you want to say is, is fine. Uh, so are there any questions? Sir? And basically there is no limits. You can ask whatever you like pretty much. I don't usually have any limits. Please, sir. Yeah. Thank you for the wonderful talk. This is very wonderful. And um, some things that I can't let go of, the crazy that I can't seem to let go of at all, is the need to help others pretty much constantly. Okay. And it means that I can't even meditate. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Even for five minutes, yeah. I kind of feel offensive. <laughs> so you're feeling selfish. And then there's a restlessness. And yeah. then like a really strong drive to go, go, go constantly. Mm. And I'm not necessarily attached to the outcome of helping, but there's a sense of needing to do that. And I okay. can't go with it. Okay, yeah. it's a pretty good attachment, yeah. I mean, if, yeah, as far as cravings goes, a pretty, it's a pretty good yeah, one. I love it. Yeah, I can't meditate. Can't meditate. Okay. Yeah. Well, remember that one of the one of the ways of maybe dealing with that is to remember that if you do some meditation practice as well, your ability to help others will be actually be enhanced. Yeah. yeah? yeah. So yeah. remember that because you get more clarity about things, you get more understanding of what exactly is the best way of helping other people. Yeah. Yeah. So try to try to see it in that way, yeah. So enhance your ability, make yourself a bit more wise first of all, because right? yeah. wisdom happens through stillness and peace, uh, and then you're actually increasing things even even more. Yeah? So to one of the ways to one of the problems with meditation practice is that uh, you you have been here tonight for just wasted two hours, yeah, not helping anyone. Yeah? So it shows you that it's possible to do, well, yeah. Even now yeah. I've been here. Have you been thinking about it? Have you? Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Like that. Okay. Um, and but it just it just it jolts me out. It literally jolts me out of meditation after yeah. five minutes. Okay. And then um, I now don't even want to sit down. Don't sit down. Yeah. It's just so fresh, maybe. I don't know. Okay. Just, try, 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 one thing you can try to do is try to find a uh, situation for yourself which actually gives rise to kind of a feeling of peace to some extent. Uh, so, mm -hmm. first of all, one of the things to do is to have a nice place to sit down where you can do your meditation practice that kind of is yeah. peaceful, has the right vibe, and all this kind of thing. So, if you like to use guided meditation, some people hate guided meditations, and that's fine, you don't have to do it. But if, if you like to use just someone who kind of gets you in the right mood a little bit, uh, yeah. And this is one of the things, because sometimes when you are by yourself, it can be quite difficult to get in the right mood. Mm -hmm. So get somebody who you feel you trust, somebody you feel has the kind of right tone of voice for you, who gives you instructions that are meaningful to you, mm -hmm. yeah, and who reminds you of the importance of being wise before you go out, yeah, <laughs> something like that. And then actually, I can sometimes put you in the right kind of mood to be able to do it. These things are important. These things are important. Yeah. Sometimes uh, deliberately take some time out. You know, go on a retreat for a weekend or something like that. Yeah, and just kind of go with Venerable Chanda or whatever. If she does, do you do weekend retreats, Venerable? Yeah, 
Yeah? She does wiggle bits, yeah? Yeah. yeah. So, so there you are. So, so do something like that. And deliberately take some time out. You, because you're not being selfish at all. The, the high, I mean, I would be extraordinarily selfish if meditation makes me selfish. I'd be one of the most selfish people in the world, probably. Ajahn Brahm would be ex- exceptionally selfish. He goes on a six month retreat, and all he does is kind of sitting in meditation, does absolutely nothing else. But someone like Ajahn Brahm, there are few people in this world who inspire more other people than Ajahn Brahm. Just by being six months on retreat, he inspires heaps of people to meditate, to practice the spiritual life, to do all of these good things, just by doing nothing. Doing nothing is extraordinarily powerful. Yeah, so start to look at these things a different way. Yeah? And you will, yeah, you will if you do that. Even if you continue to study the Buddhist teachings, continue to listen to Dharma talks a little bit, at least five minutes until you feel restless, yeah? yeah. <laughs> and then you kind of next day you, you kind of start on the next five minutes and then after a week you've gone through the whole Dharma talk, yeah, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so only so, and as you do that, what starts to happen is that your attitude, your view, will start to change about the world. Uh, and you start to get what in Buddhism is called right view. Your outlook will change. Your values will change. Uh, and it comes simply from listening to Dharma talks, studying the Buddhist teachings, understanding what is truly valuable in life. Uh, so keep on doing the right thing. Keep on practicing this way. You will get there, yeah? How long have you been trying to meditate? Uh? Um, a difficult question. Difficult question, for okay. Years. For years, for years. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Really doing it okay. and then neglecting it okay. completely. But I'm not when I say oh I just want to help. I'm I'm not trying to humble brag because sometimes this obsession drives yeah. me to yeah. anger. Okay. So I'm recognizing that yeah. I'm not being wise. But this I just need to shift. Okay. Shift that. I don't know. It's, yeah, it's yeah, you're already on the right track because you know what the problem is. So just yeah. keep on brainwashing yourself with dumb talks and eventually yeah. get there. <laughs> yeah, I will. Thank you so much. <laughs> Good. Okay. Good. Good. Can I? Is there any? Can I, is there one? Okay, I have, yes. I have two. Do you have zero? Is that right? Yeah, I finished one. You finished one already? Mm-hmm. Okay. At least two. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Anyone else would like to say something? Yes, please. Sir. When you meditate and you mind wanders, yeah. um, what is it that brings you back to uh, a mind object? Okay, so the, um, the, the one, the. Uh, there's many reasons for that, but uh, the uh, the main reason because you're not all that interested in the meditation object, yeah, that's the main reason. Uh, interest, the breath, yeah, yeah, the breath, whoa, so boring, yeah, whoa, uh, I'd rather think about this, think about that, and all these kind of things. So there's two things that I would recommend you do to be able to uh, focus on whatever meditation object you're using. The first one is you have to make the breath interesting, yeah. Yeah? And if you listen to some of the instructions I was giving while I was going through it now, I was saying, make the breath your friend. Make the breath something you care for. Yeah? Something you feel gentle and kindly towards. And when you feel gentle and kindly towards something, you're actually bringing up very positive, positive perceptions about that thing. And you start to want to be around that. Yeah? It's like you want to be around, just like you want to be around kind people or, or pleasant people. You want to be around your own mind. If the mind is gentle, the mind is kind, the mind has a bit of metta and compassion, all these kind of things. Yeah? So bring up these positive perceptions. And this is one reason why uh, virtue, why kindness in our daily life is so absolutely fundamental on the Buddhist path. Because the more kind you're able to be in your daily life, the more good you're going to feel about yourself when you sit down. The easier it is to follow your breath because everything feels good and nice. So this, these things have to come together, yeah? yeah. I'm just thinking yeah? about <laughs> what part of my mind brings me back to meditating. Is in my mind wanders and my heart of me thinks, yeah? well, I need to come back. Yeah, yeah. Don't, don't, so not, yeah. 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 As it were. So, what, what, what brings it back? Well, what brings it back is just that your mindfulness re arises. Yeah? yeah, that's what brings it back. Suddenly, so, you know, oops, I'm not, I'm not watching the breath. That's mindfulness. So, when that happens, uh, uh, what I would recommend you do is not, don't just go back to the breath straight away. Uh, just be aware, okay, I lost the breath, uh, and just wait. Uh, yeah, don't, don't, because if you go back to the breath straight away, there's always a bit of grasping there, a bit of attachment, mm-hmm. holding on. Uh, instead, tell yourself, this is just a perception, perceptual technique. This, this is not really. Uh, it's quite the right, exactly what happens. But the perceptual technique is to just imagine yourself waiting for the breath to come back to you. Instead of you going to the breath, you are waiting for the breath to come to you. It's like being the passenger on the train again. Yeah? You're being passive. Instead of you being active and doing things, you are passive. So you're waiting, you're the passenger. 
when is the breath going to come back into the window again? When are they going to see the next breath? Oh, there it is. Okay, now I'm following the breath again. Now. So this, what it does, it gives you the perception of being passive. And this is such an important part of the meditation practice. Uh, so it leads you to passiveness. Uh, but I think, you know, the, the really important question for you is how do you avoid the mind wandering in the first place? Uh, and that is how you do that, is precisely by seeing the breath in a positive light, uh, by making the meditation a priority. Uh, yeah? One of the things is that once you start to understand the teachings of the Buddha, you understand this is, if you really get that this is what life is all about, uh, everything in life becomes about Buddhism, becomes about practicing in one way or another. Yeah? Every time you open your mouth, you, you think, wait, how would I do this in the right way? So it's in accordance with the Dhamma. Yeah? This is, and this is very interesting, because it, uh, it, your whole life, you, 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 you uh, change your perception of what your entire life is about, and your life becomes subsumed under the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, yeah? Whether it's your work life, whether it's your uh, family life, everything becomes part of the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, and it improves your relationships, it improves everything, everything becomes better as a consequence, including your meditation practice. Uh, so this is how you, how you do these things in the long run. Uh, and then when you prioritize your spiritual life in that way, uh, when you come to your meditation, because you already have prioritized your spiritual life so much, you're not going to think about those silly worldly things anymore, because they're secondary. Those worldly things are there to support your meditation, not the other way around. Sometimes people come to meditation class saying, yeah, if I meditate a lot, I can become a better manager, I can become a better father, I can become better, all these kind of things. And because you think like that, it means your priority is being a better father, your priority is being a better manager, your priority is to be a better stockbroker, whatever else it is. And if that is your priority, when you meditate, you're going to think about it. By default, because that's what's the most important thing for you. If you turn it around and subsume all of these other things under the spiritual life, that is the most important thing. Then when you sit down, you're not going to think about them anymore. Because they're secondary. They have fulfilled their function. Now you're doing what is really important. And that is doing your meditation practice. Yeah. <laughs> so that's just, these are just ways of thinking about it. Yeah, everybody's slightly different. So see if that, uh, that works for you or not. Was there somebody over there wanted to say something? Yes, please. How would you describe the states of meditation in a very disciplined and creative discipline? Yeah. That sounds like a very sensual pleasure. <laughs> I mean, like, you know, without meditating, you get that, and if you want to go on a retreat, it's like really enjoyable, and you've got to chill down, etc., etc. If you go and meditate, you can just go and you have to come back to the work and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so it's kind of, I'm sort of, I suppose what I'm asking is that, like, how do you integrate that into your day? Integrate that into your daily life. Yeah, yeah. You don't really, yeah. You go and retreat. You enjoy that, and you often you don't enjoy that. Yeah, that's how well, you do it. Yeah, yeah. It's like yeah. you know, when you're peaceful, when you're sitting, you're peaceful. Yeah. Then, then you have to get up and do something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you're kind of yeah. just trying to keep it. Yeah, I don't don't try too hard to keep it with you because if you do, you're just using trying to use willpower to kind of control your life. You're not going to be able to control it anyway. Don't try that. I wouldn't recommend that. When you go on retreat, then enjoy the meditation and the bliss and everything else. Use if you want to meditate in your daily life. It's a wonderful thing to do. Don't expect any kind of profound results in daily life. If I were you, use your meditation in daily life just to help you to have an even better heart if you can, to be an even better person. Yeah, to to say more kind things to people around you. To kind of, you know, the people you meet in every day say something kind of you never said to someone before that really kind of shocks them, yeah? Wow, you're such a wonderful colleague, yeah? I'm so glad you've been my colleague for the last three years or whatever. Yeah? How, do, do people hear this kind of things often in, in kind of work life? Huh? Is that the thing you hear? Do people say to you, wow, I love having you as a colleague? Yeah? Does that happen? Huh? Complaining, yeah. So, so, so say that, yeah. So say that. And when you say that, you kind of surprise people, huh? and it becomes very beautiful. So this is about how to use your daily life and all the daily opportunities to actually live really well. So use your meditation practice in daily life, not to try to be mindful, uh, but just to be mindful enough so that you're able to be kind. Yeah? That is enough mindfulness. But mindfulness for its own sake, just to it's not really all that useful. It is useful if it is used to enable you to reduce the defilements, reduce the anger, improve the kindness. That is why mindfulness really is useful. Because you are able to see what is going on in your mind, so you can then take appropriate reactions. But just being mindful for mindfulness' sake isn't really all that. Uh, it doesn't really have much uh, uh, power to it. Uh, 
this is what I would say. I, 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 I'm sure I'm not really answering your question properly because I'm not really, I'm kind of being a bit naughty, but I hope you, <laughs> <laughs> hope you don't mind. Uh, <laughs> you want to come back? You want to say, ask something more? You're more than welcome to. I know what you mean. Yeah? Okay, good. Yeah. Anyone else want to say something? Yeah, I'd like to say something. Yeah, please then. Yeah. Um, this is uh, it, tonight. You talked about focusing on the pro on the process. Mm. This is something that you discussed in a talk that you did a few weeks ago about getting rid of sensual pleasures. And okay. That was, <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Okay. That, yeah. that was um, yeah. that was very interesting because that's something that really stayed with me because it's very the way that I see it, and I, I think you've you've already kind of answered my question about yeah. Uh, it's basically focusing on every process, everything that we do, yeah. like in on our daily lives, yeah. and that's probably the way. That's the way to practice. Right? Exactly, precisely, precisely. Yeah, yeah. Because this path really starts to work when you are when you have absolute full commitment to the path, yeah. and you persevere it, persevere with it. Every moment you have, have an opportunity to do something good, you take every opportunity. Yeah. Every opportunity you have to do something bad, you don't take that opportunity. Yeah, you let it let it be. Yeah. And uh, that is when the path really starts to work. Yeah. So it, this is the hardest, the hardest part in Buddhism. Oops, uh, is uh, speaking with the microphone in the right way. So, <laughs> you know, the, the hardest part in, in, in Buddhism is actually that commitment and perseverance to the practice. That is the hardest part. Yeah. How do you get that? And the way you get that commitment and perseverance in the end is just listening to the Dhamma. Yeah, coming back to the word of the Buddha, allowing that to brainwash you in a beautiful way. Yeah. And uh, the, the idea of brainwashing is actually very nice because it all cleans out your mind on the one hand uh, and on the other hand it kind of changes your views in a more positive direction. Uh, and then it happens automatically. Uh. But for me what, what that meant also, like, because uh, there's a lot that I don't know about the, the Dharma and yeah. the big picture if you like, but it sort of like made it si simpler and safer yeah. okay. because it was yeah. something that you can do, like you can focus on what's in front of you. Yeah. And that is a process. Good, great, yeah, wonderful. Okay, excellent. Yeah, happy to hear that. Yeah, <laughs> it's wonderful. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Sure. Yeah, but that, that, that is, a, I think, that is a very important part of the in the Anapanasati Sutta, not the Satipatthana Sutta, Parimukha uh, Satik Upatapetva, and it means having established mindfulness, Parimukha. The question is, what does Parimukha mean? Yeah, that's the big question. And of course, if you go to the uh, kind of commentaries and you go to the what is called the ex exegetical tradition of, of Buddhism, which is the kind of the explanatory tradition, which is the Patisambhida Magga that you're talking about, which is the Vasudhi Magga, which is also the Abhidhamma really as well. Yeah. The way they explain that is that you have to have your attention on the breath on the upper lip or the tip of your nose in this area here. Yeah. That is what they say. That is kind of the standard way that this is explained in uh, the commentaries. Yeah. But uh, whether that is correct or not is actually very, is not really clear. It is not very certain whether that actually is right. Yeah. And there have been studies done, like with so many things on the word Paramukha, what does it actually mean? And I think my my friend Venabhatanala, who is kind of a scholar of the highest caliber and who uh, has written, I don't know how many papers on Buddhism, it's too many uh, actually, probably, but <laughs> lots and lots and lots. And some of them are very, very good, yeah. And, and he did a detailed uh, study on the word Parimukha, yeah. And he came to the conclusion that in the suttas, in the word of the Buddha, it does not actually mean, have anything to do with upper lip or the tip of the nose. Yeah? The word mukha, the word mukha in Pali means the face or the mouth, yeah? So basically what is kind of, and pari mukha, the prefix pari often has this feeling of all around or kind of something like that. Sometimes it's often prefixes are a bit vague, but that's kind of the general meaning of, of pari. Yeah? So something like just, you know, in the, the way I think he eventually uh, ended up translating it was something like uh, uh, awareness in the present space and the present moment, something like that. It means, basically what it means, present moment, 
and present space, yeah? Right here, right now, if you like, yeah? That's what it means. So, and the one, one way of interpreting that, and this is the way Ajahn Brahm always teaches meditation, and the way that I've been following as well, yeah? and I think it works really, really nicely, yeah? and that is the idea of not worrying about where you are watching the breath, yeah? because it's not body contemplation. If you focus about the point, it becomes body contemplation rather than breath contemplation, yeah? Because you're worried about you know, in the stomach or here or, you know, where exactly, yeah. you know, in the Maha situation, they say, oh, you should feel it in the abdomen, yeah, uh, in the other, they say, say up here, so, uh, but it's not body contemplation, it's breath contemplation, yeah. So all we have to do is to know whether the breath is going in, it is going out. It doesn't matter where, as long as you know it is going in, yeah. and you can know that without reference to the body, yeah. you can know it as a purely kind of abstracted from the body, if you like, whether the breath is going in or breath is going out. As your mindfulness improves, you may find that it is in a certain place, but initially it is almost as if it is abstracted from the body, just the breath going in and the breath going out. That's all you have to know. And that, I think, is a, is a suitable way of looking at the breath meditation, because one of the problems of narrowing it down too much initially, especially, is that your mind can often become very tense. And people often talk about the samadhi headaches. I heard about samadhi headache. The people focusing, focusing, focusing. Oh, my head. Oh, it's actually non samadhi headache because it's not really samadhi at all. Yeah, it's, it's the anti samadhi headache. But anyway, this is what people get, and they get that precisely because the focus is too narrow. So ideally, when you start out, you want to have a focus which is a little bit larger. It gives us the mind a little bit more scope for movement, so you don't feel so trapped with the meditation object. And then gradually, the focus comes down. As you become peaceful, the focus comes down more to one point or one particular place. And I think that is a very skillful way of doing the Anapanasati. And I would forget about the Patasambhita Magaya, it doesn't matter so much, and follow the what I think is probably a I would say, I mean, it's very hard to be absolutely sure about these things, but I think that's a better way of looking at it. Yeah. Yes, something like that. I was, yeah. um, I was reading the teaching, and the teacher was saying, talking about renunciation, saying there's no point in giving something up because the teacher said you should, because if you force yourself to give something up, you'll still think about it and obsess over it. Yeah. And when the time comes, you'll be ready yourself to do something. Mm. Okay, yeah. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of truth to that, you know, because you can't really force yourself. Uh, um, yeah, but uh, obviously, it's good to get the teachings about what you may want to give up, yeah? <laughs> That's kind of another way of putting it. So, this is what you may want to give up, yeah? Uh, keep the five precepts. You may want to give up killing living beings. You may want to give up stealing. You may want, and you think, yeah, maybe I should give up. Oh, not yet. I don't feel like it yet. I need to steal a bit more first of all. <laughs> and then down the track, I will give up stealing, yeah? So this, is, this, is the way, this is the way you do it. <laughs> and then uh, gradually move in that direction. But this is particularly true of very profound attachments. Yeah? And this is probably what you mean here. So if somebody says, give up sensual pleasures, of course, uh, that is where it gets much more tricky. Yeah? Because these things are definitely places where you have to be very careful. If you try to give up what you're not ready to give up, it's going to cause so much suffering for yourself. Yeah? So when it comes to the pleasures of life, you know, you, oh, I shouldn't be playing so many video games, or I shouldn't be kind of indulging in this or that or whatever, allow that to come more naturally. Try to get an understanding, first of all, why it is problematic, yeah? why it doesn't work for you. Right? The deeper your understanding is, uh, the easier it's going to be for you to let it go eventually. Yeah. So with those things, I definitely agree. Yeah. And if you want to become, an, people want to become monastics, yeah, it's very interesting on this retreat we had up in the lake, in the uh, Peak District, uh, and a few people were excited about thinking about becoming monastics, yeah, and I always really enjoy that. It's really cool when people want to become monastics. Yeah. But that too is very important that you do it when you feel that it's the right time. It has to be fairly natural. Yeah. You don't force these things. You don't think, you don't have, you don't be too idealistic. Yeah, I want to be a monk. Yeah, I don't really, I, I can't really kind of, I'm sure if I can kind of do it, but I'm going to do it anyway because I have to do it. I'm going to use willpower if nothing else works. Yeah. And that doesn't work. Yeah. You're not going to last very long. Yeah, a few months down the line, you're going to disrobe and you're going to be back messing around in ordinary life again. Right? So allow things to come naturally. I think that is a very good point. Uh, yeah. So thank you for that point. Uh, I think yes. Chandi is quite critical. I think it was in the last day you uh, invoked God, said, Fear God, how do you give up pleasure of the flesh? As in, mm. pleasure of the flesh, mm. but not yet. <laughs> right, yeah, exa exactly. Yeah, I've I, I heard about that one, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so exactly. So timing is very important. And, and timing is about ripening your understanding of the Dhamma. As your understanding of the Dhamma ripens, the timing eventually becomes right. So it's all about right view. People often think that right view is either you have it or you haven't got it. Yeah, I believe in rebirth, I believe in uh, karma, or whatever else it is. But that isn't what right view is about. It's not about saying, I believe in this. Right view is about investigating these things, getting a feeling for them, making them something emotional that actually means something f- for you. Huh? And as you do that, as these things become more, you know, actually start to mean something to you, huh? then also they, uh, there's something inside of you which ripens. Huh? And, uh, eventually, you are ready to give up the uh, uh, you know, pleasures of the flesh. Huh? You don't even have to ask God to for any help. It just happens mm-hmm. automatically. Yeah? It's, it's very good in Buddhism because we haven't got a God, so it kind of comes in handy. And uh, then you, you're ready, and then it happens. Huh? So that is, uh, yeah, it's a good point. Uh, yeah. Yes, sir. Um, every year we have uh, the edition from the Bodhi Monastery. Yeah. It has a real spiritual thing. Um, and then, I guess, uh, in between, I guess, I have this thing about Chandra. Yeah. I'm just wondering whether there are uh, resident bhikkhus or bhikkhus here. Yeah. Um, just one year. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And then you say that. <laughs> the same so very lucid, very engaging, light way of teaching that you um, yeah. bring teaching to us so that we can engage with the uh, as well as the The internet is available, yeah. That you have so many teachers on the internet these days. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you like kind of Ajahn Brahm's teachings, then you can go find them on the internet. They're, they're available. Uh, um, so uh, I think the, one of the great things about the internet is precisely that teachings are suddenly available in a brand new way that have never been made before. Uh, so use that. What did you say? It's something about the Bodhinyana coming? What was the word you used? Uh, the monastery where yeah. I think you, you, you coming here once a year. Is that what yes, you said? Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. It's yeah. Very yeah. Very okay. Very yeah. Very yeah. Very sure. Very sure. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Yeah. This is this is exactly right. This is what I found so attractive by Ajahn Brahm's teaching. Uh, it was very engaging. It was very easy to understand. It was very profound at the same time. Uh, engaging, profound, and easy to understand. Uh, okay, that's my kind of teaching. Yeah. Again, the, many many good things coming together it makes it actually very very powerful and very beautiful. Uh, so I, I agree with you and. Uh, I think that one reason why um, meditation teachers often are not like that is because traditionally the way med- uh, Buddhism has been taught in traditional Buddhist countries uh, is very kind of formalized, very, very formal. Uh, and many of the Western monks, especially those who are trained in Asia, they have learned that way of doing things uh, and they con- tend to continue in that kind of track. Yeah. And uh, I, you know, for me, one of, what, what I think is very important, we want to... When we, when we bring the Dhamma to the West, and it's still very new in the Western world, yeah? when we do that, we have to engage differently. We have to do things in a way which is kind of more standard way of doing things in the Western world that people can appreciate, people can actually you know, and, and enjoy in a different way. I think that is so important. Uh, we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We shouldn't throw away rebirth, which is fundamental to the Buddhist teachings. Uh, but what we can do, we can adjust some of the more superficial things, some of the more kind of cultural aspects of Buddhism. They, they are not so important. Uh, and re, kind of redo those a little bit for a modern era. And this is precisely what Ajahn Brahm has been so good at bringing up modern problems and things, how to resolve them in the modern era, making the Dhamma interesting and also entertaining at the same time. Sometimes because they're a little bit too entertaining, but I, <laughs> no, I don't know about that. But, you know, and, and it's, it's wonderful when that happens, yeah? And it actually becomes very powerful. So I, I always look for ways of making the Dhamma more accessible. Uh, one, you know, one of the things that you notice is that the mindfulness movement has become very powerful around the world. Uh, and, uh, and the re- one of the reasons, I think, why it has been so successful is that uh, uh, the teachings are in large part drawn straight from the Dhamma, straight from Buddhism, no copyright, nothing to take it away. Yeah? Really unfair. But, and, <laughs> and, uh, and, and why it is successful? Because the entry barrier is so low. Yeah, there's no, it's, it's secular. There's no, there's no kind of weird robe yeah, and shaven heads, none of that kind of nonsense. Yeah, it's, it's basic. Take, you take out all the kind of what people consider the superstitious aspects of Buddhism and just retain what they consider the core. Of course, that's not what happens. What happens is that you take away all the things that matter at the same time. But that's a, that's a different story. So sometimes we should do the same thing in Buddhist circles. 
try to find a way to make the Dhamma so it actually the entry barrier isn't so great. Yeah, we don't have a five meter tall Buddha statue, for example. Yeah, when it's like, whoa, whoa, this is scary. It scares people. I remember when I started out on the Buddhist path, I was scared of all of this kind of things. These monks in robes and these massive Buddha statues. It was kind of intimidating. Yeah? Uh, and you realize actually there must be better ways of, of doing this. Uh, so I was thinking whether I should come tonight in jeans and t-shirt. <laughs> Actually, the interesting thing is that if you look at the, uh, the word of the Buddha, there probably isn't, there wouldn't have been any problem with that. Yeah, I could have done that, uh, and I wouldn't really have been breaking any rules as such. Uh, but it wouldn't have been the same. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I don't think so. I think this, this robe is actually quite cool. I think probably we'll, we'll be wearing these robes also in the future. Yeah? So because they, they kind of they, they kind of advertise something something different. Yeah, if you come in jeans and t-shirt, just like everyone else, it doesn't really make any difference. Uh, so. Uh, Anyway, and also, once you get to my age, you get a bit overweight, yeah? <laughs> this is much better when you get a bit overweight, yeah? Otherwise, you kind of... Uh, <laughs> no, that's not the reason, yeah? Anyway. Fin oh, we should finish up, uh, yeah. Okay, so what should we do finishing up, uh? Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, any last question? Uh? It's the panel of Tanda who give us an update on, uh, um, yeah. on the project. I think that would be really great. But let's just take one last question from Matt at the back. Yeah, please, Matt. Uh, yeah. Come on, okay, please. Uh, about uh, the question about uh, what, uh, how to take things away from retreats. Um, I remember that after my first retreat, um, I think you can't, it's hard to take away the Buddha, the, the, the fact of enlightenment away, um, because let's say there's a lot of distraction in our life and it's so busy. But um, I thought you need to just consider the noble eight path. Portion of it is just what like you and and Princess Hila, um, yeah. and by mindfulness comes in much later down. A lot of the factors about uh, managing how we interact with other people and kindness, as you say, right? kindness is really something you can take away. Yeah. And sort of develop it almost as if you know, the world free as a retreat, mm. but you can take it away. Um, so I was at the old retreat over the weekend and. I was noticing myself to be a lot more kind to my stars or colleagues today at work. So thank you for yeah. mentioning that I did this resonate with me. Mm -hmm. um, and I think even more sometimes we get a sense of how liberation <coughs> could be achieved because we take some steps towards that happiness, we experience that happiness and it's something you could never experience before. Um, and I think that gives rise to a lot of right view. About how it would be in terms of possibility. Um, and that always stays with you, at least it did for me. Uh, and I think that kind of, I think even for the Buddha, it was the same because he didn't even remember his childhood, the years of Janus, it stayed with him. And he remembered it as a year forward. So I think that was the most powerful thing that I had for us. Yeah, yeah, I fully agree with all that. Yeah, I, that's certainly true. So, uh, yeah, you take away those things that sort of can be taken away and you have to leave behind those things that are difficult to take with you. So, yeah. Anyway, I'm going to just say, very, I'll say a little bit first. I'll say a little bit first. Uh, and one of the reasons I have come to the England, UK, uh, where I'm here, is because I was invited by Kvinda Machanda. And many of you know, you, all of you know her already, uh, every one of you? Yeah? Okay. And uh, she is trying to establish a monastery for fully ordained nuns, Vietnamese, uh, in the UK. Uh, there is no such monastery in the UK at the moment, is that right? Yeah, yes. correct. Yeah, that's correct. So there's only one bikini. There's only one bikini as well. <laughs> and uh, the idea behind this is to kind of give a, uh, a level playing field between uh, nuns and monks as far as possible. Uh, and also to give women the chance to ordain in the Buddhist, uh, in the Buddhist sasana, the Buddhist... Uh, uh, the, 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 the Buddhist kind of Buddhist thing, yeah. <laughs> the Buddhist Sangha, yeah, to ordain the Buddhist Sangha, uh, so that uh, they have the best possible situation to also reach all these wonderful things I've been talking about tonight: uh, uh, liberation of the mind, liberation and wisdom, all of these wonderful things. Uh, there's a remarkable and wonderful thing that she is doing. And it's actually very difficult. She is by herself, not having any support is very, very hard. Monastic life is really a life where you are supported by your fellow monastics. And to be by yourself is actually very difficult. And this is why she comes to Australia and stays close to Bodhinana Monastery every year for three months, just to be with Ajahn Brahm and to have a chance to kind of develop her meditation properly down there. 
So it is a very difficult thing that she's doing and she really needs all the support that she can have to make this vision into a reality. So I'm just letting you know that so that you understand the situation and so that if you uh, want to support in one way or another, that would be a wonderful and marvelous thing. You're supporting something really quite historical, yeah, something very, uh, hopefully, would be very, very useful for Buddhism in the UK in the future. Yeah. Okay, well, now, you want to say something? Yeah. I want to say something. <laughs> you can. So first I just want to thank you, Ajahn Mali. You said that it's rare to hear um, kind words or powerful words, but I want to thank you for being a wonderful Kalyanamita on this path. I feel like I've gained so much in terms of personal support during this time, and I think that bringing the early Buddhist teachings to England in the way you have, and being able to elucidate them with so much clarity and inspiration has just been really moving for many people. And many people have told me that it was the best retreat they've ever done. Um, which is quite a big thing to say and a lot of people came for the first time to that retreat it was their first experience of meditation and they came specifically because they knew that this would put them on the path in a really clear way you know in a way that they can understand and have that direct relationship to the Buddha so thank you very much okay. it's difficult to express with words but um, Leah just asked about the uh, Bikini project and, and where we're up to with that now, normally I go into all this kind of technical, sort of mundane stuff, but this evening I just felt so touched to kind of look at everybody here. I had my eyes open most of the time, and I felt like this is where we're at. I mean, I know half the people in this room, many of you have been key supporters right from the beginning, and not just supporting the project, but supporting me also with a lot of love and a lot of warmth, and, you know, without that it wouldn't be possible. So in a sense, people here have been my spiritual friends, also my spiritual colleagues, <laughs> also my supporters and it's not me that you're supporting actually you know it's the development of Buddhism in England so yes it's for the Bhikkhuni Sangha but through supporting the Bhikkhuni Sangha and also offering a residence eventually because all the donations are going to go towards building up a place to stay we can have a presence in this country and that means of course more regular teaching so I'm just starting out teaching but I'm really confident I have excellent teachers <laughs> and so at least I have some kind of understanding of where this path is going and, and how to proceed along it and I think like Ajahn Vimali said it's not so much the goal but the process so um, yeah for me the process is very much about kindness very much about um, making peace with everything that arises in our mind and in our practice and really allowing a natural kind of unfolding of the Dhamma. So, I mean, this for me is very exciting and I feel we're all in it together, really. And so this isn't something that I'm doing for others, it's something we're all doing together. And so, in a sense, this is the monastery right now, you know, the people in this room, the atmosphere that we have together, you know, the love that's here, the sense of spiritual friendship that's here is, is the monastery. And hopefully, over time, we'll find, you know, conducive places to, to develop that. And, and not only can women train, but lay people, men and women, can come and stay. So, you know, the more property we have, the more acres we have, the, the more opportunity there is for that. And I just want to thank, if that's okay, without embarrassing people, a few people in person, because here we have um, Anna Campus Treasurer, Tehani. So I want to really thank you, Tehani. And Tehani, do you want to stick your hand up? Because you'll be coming for the okay. Rains retreat. She's coming uh -huh, really? flying okay. on the plane okay. with me. Yeah, the really good. Yeah. And this is yeah. uh, going to really strengthen the whole project because when we have people involved who really practice, you know, that gives a different energy to the whole thing. Amina's here, and Amina's been with me right from the very beginning for the first couple of years doing pretty much everything that I couldn't do on, online. <laughs> and, um, and, yeah specifically, I mean, helping with the tours, but also helping us with uh, getting registered as a charity. And that was a huge kind of milestone for us. And uh, she did such a good job with the help of some of the colleagues as well, the trustees, that we got registered within a month of our application. Which one is she? Amina. <laughs> She's the one that giggles a lot. <laughs> and her sense of humor is great, and it's very contagious. <laughs> Yeah, and there's several other people here who've hosted me many times. Rita at the back here, I just want to thank for being here tonight because I know Rita's really not so well. And for you to turn up and come and talk like this, you know, despite the physical difficulties that you're going through, it just shows such devotion to the Dhamma. And I want you to really appreciate that in yourself, you know, because that's huge. That's actually huge. And Anna also, she's part of the Buddhist Society. There's a few people here. Richard's here. 
Richard met Ajahn Chah a long time back. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, wow. That's pretty and cool. Liz is here <laughs> next to him, and Anna. Yeah. And the Great Wood Buddhist Society yeah. have been supporting me as a group, really, inviting me to teach. Also, developing some like nice little uh, fundraising initiatives to spread Dhamma, so little bags and some books. So, tonight at the end, uh, we've only got about 10 minutes before we have to leave, but um, there'll be some books available at the back um, with some of Ajahn Brahmali's like poignant quotes and some nice photographs of various Dhamma places in the world. So, they're available for everybody to take. Um, yeah, and yeah, Kirsty also is supporting us, helping me with the newsletter and uploads of YouTube and many other people are involved. So it's really for everybody. So uh, yeah, hopefully by January next year we might have a, a small base, but it'll be small. It'll be just a residence basically where I can have a bit of rest and there'll be a room for someone to come and stay with me. Maybe maybe not someone for the whole period, but like have a few people coming and. Uh, just experiencing how that feels. I think the first step will be a little bit uh, interesting and maybe a bit tricky because it won't feel like a monastery straight away. It'll be more like a little vihara, you know, so you live together and just find a little bit of a balance between some structure and some, you know, solitary time to practice. But eventually when we get the team more strong and cohesive, then we'll move into something bigger and, yeah, more rural. But even in the beginning, I've decided to have this place in the countryside because countryside living, I mean, forest in the cities, is much more conducive to practice and much more inspiring, I think. Um, and we just spent a month, uh, almost a month, with Udita, who's also here from Latvia, um, uh, in uh, Lyme Regis on the south coast. And what was really lovely there was not only, of course, being supported by someone who came over specifically for that purpose to support not me, but the Sangha, you know. Um, was also finding that about seven days at least we had people coming to offer dharma. And that's in a small town, you know, on the south coast, which is not that accessible. But there were people all over the place actually who want this to happen. So that really inspired me and I think that gives me confidence that we can actually start in a way we need to continue. Yeah. So avoid London, that's the key bit. Because I should have been like, yeah, start in London. Yeah. yeah. So that's how we're gonna start. So yeah. So thank you very much okay. to everybody. Yeah, okay. um, there'll be an opportunity to give donations at the back and to have the books and whatever else. And uh, hopefully see you all again yeah. somewhere until now and next year. Thank you. Very good. Yeah. Oui, je suis sweating là. Vous êtes sweating Oui, je suis sweating. 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 Yeah, it's a dance and a massive fun. Yeah, great. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, great. I'm glad, very glad to hear that. Yeah, yeah. Are you are you from uh, are you a Sri Lankan background? Or are you from yeah. Sri Lankan background? Okay, yeah, yeah. I was raised uh, Catholic. Ah, okay, yeah. But it didn't make sense. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but um, I've been diagnosed with uh, MNC. Ah, oh, really? Ah, oh, okay. I see. Yeah, yeah. I am. Uh, I met somebody recently who had the same one and said, so just, uh, yeah, so uh, just live well, you know, yeah, do the right thing, and uh, that's, the, that's the best thing you can do. Right? Yeah. 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 It's the most significant thing. It's yeah. my body, guys. Yeah. Mind is it for yeah. exactly. the whole thing. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So just, just yeah, so that's, that's, so keep on doing that, and then you're making the best, making the best of a difficult, of a difficult situation. Because it is difficult, so. Just I'm learning a lot. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. From that. Uh, good, yeah, good, good. Yeah. But I have a Good luck with everything. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> okay, very good. <laughs> It's different, my, I'm from Sri Lanka. Yes, I, 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 I guessed, yeah. It's different. <laughs> it's different. Yeah, the teaching is different. Yeah. Do, you live, do you live over here or do you live in... Uh, yes, I'm living You're living over here, yeah. 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 But uh, I'm listening uh, every day in YouTube. Okay. Uh, 
Is that brown? Yeah. yeah? Okay. Yeah. Must be subtitled. Subtitled. Yeah. Yeah. It's very fast. Yeah. Okay. But okay. today I understand. Okay. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I really just wanted to say that it's great to meet you and I think your talks are wonderful. Okay. And that last talk, for some reason, like, really hits something It's strange. It's sometimes it really hits home and sometimes yeah. it really works. It's often, often like that. You have to be in the right mood. It has to be the right talk at the right time. It's a bang. Something yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and... Did you talk to me? 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 Did